Getting millions of people to care about your new game is a fine art, a feat of marketing and PR that encompasses so many factors and can go so, so wrong at so many points. As such, some publishers or developers have often avoided the fair, simple option of releasing an honest trailer and letting the public make up their own mind. Instead, they've flat out lied to shift units, and naturally this approach has been a massive success, but it's a pretty disgusting one. There's marketing a video game, and then there's intentionally deceiving people. And though several of the following games are actually pretty good, it doesn't get around the fact that what people paid for wasn't what they got. Thankfully, recent years have got the industry firmly back on track, but gaming's history is filled with some almighty clangers, many of which resulted in lawsuits, the death of franchises, the tarnation of once beloved industry figures, or all three and more. Honestly, if lies are porky pies, the game industry is a meatpacking plant. I'm Scott from Okota.com, and these are 11 flat-out lies you were told to sell video games. Number 11, the Xbox One's Kinect works. Let's just start out with a pretty overt, surface-level lie. Microsoft showed the Kinect working with the Xbox One, but in reality, it just didn't. Cast your mind back to 2013, and you'll see Yusuf Mehdi getting on stage to expand or contrast various application windows and scroll through screens with his hands, truly showing off the power of the Kinect. Even in this footage, you can tell that things don't line up with his actions, and especially in retrospect, it's insane how much Microsoft got away with. Why? Because cut to launch day and hundreds of Xbox Ones couldn't even recognize voices or hand gestures to save their lives. Thus, after a year of Microsoft insisting that the Kinect was an integral part of the Xbox One experience, they gutted the thing from their bundle deals, reorganized the dashboard, commissioned the Xbox One S and the Xbox One X, and never looked back. Ironically, of all people, it's now Microsoft who don't recognize their own Kinect. Number 10, Crackdown 3 runs using the power of the cloud. Not to be your actual dad, but does anyone know what the hell powered by the cloud even means? I don't mean in theory, because we all know that in theory, Microsoft had commissioned some stupidly expensive cloud farm of servers that would apparently help render games in real time alongside physical hardware. They threw the term cloud-powered gaming around like we all knew what it meant, yet clarification never came. Were they going to stream in the backgrounds of games whilst the console handled characters and weapons? What happens if you have an internet shortage or if the connection goes even a little bit spotty? Do certain chunks of games just derez or not load in at all? Microsoft barely commented on this after the initial reveal, and suffice it to say, Crackdown 3 suffering so many delays and only releasing in 2019 is tantamount to cloud processing being nothing more than hot air. Number 9. The PS2 is like jacking into the Matrix. Peak video game bull poop. this. Speaking to Newsweek back in 2000 as part of a cover story on the PS2, former Sony CEO Ken Kutaragi got a little carried away with the power of his upcoming system. Thankfully for him, this was a time before social media and even before broadband connections, limiting this goof to just the readers of Newsweek rather than it being a laughing stock like it sounds right now. And I quote, You can communicate to a new cyber city. This will be the ideal home server. Did you see the movie The Matrix? Same interface, same concept. Starting from next year, you can jack into The Matrix. Yeah, there's, uh, there's not a single part of that that's true, is there, Ken? Maybe you've been huffing the blueprints for the PlayStation Home or dreaming up what would eventually become PSVR. Come on, have a nice sit down and play some Fantavision. There's a, there's a good lad. Number eight, every gun will tell a story, Destiny. Thanks to a fantastically revealing expose from Kotaku as to the reality of making Destiny, we know the first game was completely gutted mere months before release. Still, it didn't stop Bungie and Activision selling a lie to the general public, talking about how the game was so expansive every gun would have a story, even using footage from cutscenes that included characters nowhere to be seen in the final product. Destiny even opens with a character saying they don't have time to explain what they don't have time to explain, being ever more on the nose once you realize just what fresh hell the development team went through. That doesn't change the reality of just how much content wasn't present in the base game of Destiny though, as it would take a string of DLC packs and a solid year's worth of patches and community feedback to just barely make Destiny a respectable investment. Thankfully, Bungie have now split from Activision, and here's hoping their next IP goes a hell of a lot smoother. Number 7. Microsoft's stance on digital game trading The tail end of 2013 felt like Microsoft throwing a series of curveballs only for Sony to slam them straight out of the ballpark. One of the biggest was their baffling approach to digital rights management, in light of the Xbox One's reveal. The initial controversy stemmed from Microsoft wanting to enact a family policy where a collection of Xbox accounts could all be greenlit to gain access to the same games regardless of purchase. So far, so good. Next, they attempted to enforce a policy surrounding the purchasing and trading of license fees, which were necessary to play games even if you wanted to just lend a game from a friend. Why, you ask? Because Microsoft were determined to convince you that this was the future of all digital game trading. They even had spokesman Major Nelson talking about how the console was built from the ground up to have these features, and it wasn't as simple as just flipping a switch to turn them off. 
If you want to play games on Xbox One, you're better off buying your own copy or at least paying the fee. No ifs, no buts. Of course, it took just a week for all this to be turned around as the world's media and every Xbox fan who heard of these ideas freaked the F out as it turned out Major Nelson's unswitchable Switch was powered by money. Number 6. Almost everything about the Ouya There was a time, a real, tangible, actual point in time when it felt like the Ouya could be a thing. Look, just hear me out. So, you had a console that was completely moddable out of the box. Welcoming of upgrades from those with the know-how, it had the complete works of every console in history ready to be loaded on, and with such momentum, would surely get all the AAA publishers on board too. A perfect crowdsourced controller, minimal size, speedy processor, and... Oh, it was... it was a lie. This groundbreaking console was in reality just a mobile phone chip in a glass case. As creator Julie Ehrman squandered $8.5 million on prototypes, half-baked exclusives, and terrible adverts. She even decreed to an audience of millions that the system was nothing special, despite the project being funded by 63,416 individual backers. Ooh, no. Number 5. Ubisoft using PC footage to sell watchdogs to console gamers. If you were to point to one specific game that started this current generation off on the wrong foot, it's Watch Dogs. Suffering an immediate demonstrable downgrade in graphical quality at launch, many areas appeared to be unfinished, had blurry textures, or otherwise failed to look sufficiently next-gen. Ubisoft insisted the game had to look a certain way and that there was no downgrade, only for PC users to take one look at the game's files and note there were many graphical shaders simply turned off. Turning them back on restored the game to how it was supposed to look, leaving Ubi to respond by saying that these changes were necessary to get the game running whatsoever. Another response from the tech crowd proved that the game ran just fine, at least on PC, proving that whatever we were shown pre-release certainly wasn't on consoles. Number 4. The Play Now Console Guarantee Why do we play on consoles? Like, over time, why do the majority of people choose to game on what's meant to be a plug-and-play system? Convenience, right? Any gamer born before the 2010s will remember just how much we all used to laugh at PC gamers for their pathetically elongated install times. Why would I bother playing on PC? I'll be waiting the rest of the day to play, we all said. Sadly, that's now the reality of console gaming, as besides Phil Spencer promising to make this a priority fix for the next Xbox, you'll seldom hear it talked about from the biggest publishers or developers of the world. This console generation, far more than any before, saw promises of faster, instant access to our libraries, yet day in, day out, we're forced to wade through any number of pop-ups and loading bars to do so. The reality of larger file sizes is sure, but the sheer amount of people forking out for a brand new, bigger hard drive kinda proves my point. Number 3. You'll be able to find other players in No Man's Sky who knew that in the end, No Man's Sky would be remembered for a galaxy-sized lie rather than a fully interactive galaxy of possibilities? Thankfully, Hello Games have completely turned the game around, and I totally recommend the version that you can buy now. Back to that launch window, though, as yes, there were some naysayers all along, but creative director Sean Murray continued to tell whopper after whopper leading to the game's release. It all came to a head literally on day one, as two different players managed to travel to the same spot with the intent of meeting up, something that Sean Murray did say you could do, only for nothing to happen. Thus, this monumental mix-up was only the beginning. It emerged that not only was there no way for the game servers to sync two different experiences in real time, but our character models didn't even exist. Factional warfare, space dogfights, downed spaceships, and other multiplayer interactions, none were in the final game. If it was anything else, or if No Man's Sky had been advertised as the ambitious indie project it clearly always was, the genuine anger surrounding post-release might have abated, but as I'm sure you well remember, it was quite the opposite. Number 2. Anything Peter Molyneux has ever said. But let's talk about Fable. Where to even start? I mean, look, I totally think industries like gaming need big thinkers and visionaries like Peter Molyneux to grease the wheels of innovation, but, well, you do need to actually make good on the things you come up with in the first place. To highlight the most notable example of the 2000s, because literally just pick a decade, Molyneux claimed ahead of the first Fable's release that if you choose to carve your initials into a tree, the initials will still be there if you come back to the tree 10 years later. That's just not a thing, Peter. An idea plucked from thin air, promised to players, and then not implemented or spoken of ever again. We were also told of the ability to poison a town's water supply, to be able to lock people in houses and burn them down, to plant a tree and see it grow, or that battle cuts could be turned into scars, plus countless other features that likely only existed in that one moment and never again. Molyneux did actually apologize for his conduct in 2011, saying, Sorry if I've slightly overpromised on things on occasion. I could name at least 10 features in games I've made up to stop journalists going to sleep, and I really apologize to the team for that. This was, of course, before he leached his fanbase even further with Goddess to the tune of half a million pounds, but, well, next entry. Microsoft literally buying positive coverage for the Xbox One. 
It really makes you wonder, did Microsoft know they dropped a clangor of a press conference far before the rest of the world reminded them? It certainly feels that way in retrospect, as after a YouTuber blew the whistle on a partnership between Microsoft and Machinima, scores of others came forward to corroborate what was being said. An excerpt from the tantalizing offer that was sent to many of Machinima's YouTubers, who were otherwise supposed to be equal opportunity as reviewers or trusted sources, detailed how Machinima were actively able to offer more money to their personalities if they said nice things about Xbox products. One of the fees came down to an extra dollar per 1,000 views, though you need only look to the average YouTube view count to see just how much money was being handed back and forth. A truly manipulative way to infiltrate the world of YouTube and its influencers, the end result was viewers getting Xbox Ones and certain respective games recommended with less than honest intentions. And that's my list. Let me know down in the comments below if there were any other ridiculous lies peddled out that we all bought into. Ivan Scott from WhatCulture.com. Please check out the WhatCulture Gaming Podcast, and I'll catch you soon.